Game Jolt is fantastic. It's a damn sight better than Itch. Just look at these pages. Beautiful. Modern. Of course, you can upload your HTML5 and desktop games for free on many different sites. But Discovery is a lot better here than through the competition. One of my earliest games has over 10,000 views despite it being a terrible game. So why isn't the LibGDX gem hosted on Game Jolt? I don't actually know anyone who uploads their games here. There's no reason we can't change that though. No, we're not switching the jam over to Game Jolt. What I mean is that you can start uploading your games here too. Sure, the site is pretty, but I feel the real benefit is the Game Jolt API. This is a very slick interface for recording high scores, awarding players trophies or achievements, and recording persistent data for your players. You don't know how significant this is. This is basically a free data server for your game that you can use for matchmaking, statistics, anti-cheat, persistent saves, and more. There are hardly any restrictions as far as I can see. The only problem is that I couldn't find a good adaptation of the API that is compatible with LibGDX. I've looked through the 10 year old links. The GitHub page doesn't exist for this one. This one isn't compatible with HTML5. And this one only scratches the surface of what you can do with Game Drill. That's why I went ahead and made my own. Before I use the API directly by constructing the appropriate URLs manually. That was a real pain in the ass, but now that's all automated for you. In fact, it's never been easier to submit a high score. But before we get into that, let's briefly go over how to create a game on Game Jolt. It's actually really simple. Log into your account and click this plus button next to Manage Games. You can start the game as a devlog, but you can change this to a full game release later when it's ready to be published. Fill out the fields as they're presented to you. You should really read the linked articles which go into detail about how to make a successful game on the site. Save the draft. You can always go back and change these details, but let's focus on getting to the part where you can play with the API. Now you should be able to click on Game API. There are a couple important things you'll need to record before you continue. Click on API settings. You will not be able to use the library without the game ID and the private key. It's important to not share this private key publicly. I know I'm breaking my own rule here, but in your game a savvy player could use this to upload fake scores or even erase player data. If that happens, you can always generate a new key. Just know that if you have an open source game and you store your key directly in your code, it's going to get stolen. Consider using GitHub Secrets as a solution for this. Let's take a quick overview of what we have going on here. You have trophies that you can award to players as they accomplish things in your game. Click New Trophy under the kind of trophy you want to award. Fill out the information. You can upload your own image that the players can see on your page. Remember this trophy ID when you start using the API. Looking at scores, your game has a primary scoreboard that the API defaults to if you do not specify a table ID. You can create more scoreboards if you want. Perhaps you want to make an individual scoreboard for every level. Or maybe a separate scoreboard for points and for completion time. Difficulty levels. It's up to your imagination. Just submit scores to the appropriate table ID. Your players can view these scores directly on your game's page or through the game itself. You can configure these scoreboards to allow guest submission. That means the player does not have to have a Game Jolt account in order to participate. Their score will not have a fancy avatar associated with their score, however. Data storage is a little different. You don't create the keys ahead of time. Instead, you create the key as you use the API. This means you can have virtually unlimited storage on the fly. The restriction is that you can store only up to 16 megabytes per key, which is more than enough for a save game or a custom level upload. It's whatever you can put into a string. What you see here are all the global keys that have been saved. That is, keys that are not associated with a specific player. It's great for storing statistics or sharing data between players. You can also have player-specific keys that are private and can only be accessed by a logged-in GameJolt user. You can't see these in your game page, but you can query them when the user logs in with their username and token. 
If you look at the overview page, you can see how many user sessions are active at any time. These are logged in Game Jolt users who are currently playing your game right now. This number on the right shows you how many have played in total. It's probably better to just use the analytics page if you're curious about how many people play your game. But sessions might be important if you're managing a multiplayer game. Okay, so let's get into the code. Add the Game Jolt API to your project just like you would with any Gradle based GDX lib. Most users of the API simply want to upload a score, so I made that as easy as possible. You can start by creating an instance of the Game Jolt API, which you'll use throughout the rest of the game. Now the player has played through the game. They did really well, but they caught some shrapnel after the second boss. It's time to submit the score. For simplicity, I'm just storing the game ID and key from the game's settings as variables. I'm hard coding the guest name here, but it's expected that you allow the player to enter their name with something like a text field. Score is entered as a long value. Then it's simply a matter of putting together the utility method add guest score. Now that score shows up on the high scores table. You can instruct your players to view the scores tab of your game jolt page, but that will certainly break immersion. It's best to integrate your scores directly into your game. This can be achieved with the download scores method. You just provide a listener that processes each game jolt score and does something with it like creating labels in a table or using a bitmap font to display them all. If you restrict yourself to the above methods, you're missing out on all the other powerful features available in the Game Jolt API. These are the available namespaces in Game Jolt. Each namespace gives you access to different categories of features. Data Store lets you manipulate items in the cloud-based data storage. Time returns the server time. Scores let you add and read the scores on score tables. Sessions keep track of players playing your game. Trophies let you award player achievements. Users allow you to get data about players with user accounts. Friends let you access the player's friends list. Perhaps you can utilize that to invite players to your multiplayer game. These features are explained in more detail in the API documentation, so make sure to check that out. You can also get this documentation by reading the Java docs of each class. For example, trophies are explained in Game Jolt Trophies. For the specific feature Add Achieved, see Game Jolt Trophies. Trophies Add Achieved Request. You need to make a request to use the API. These are created using a builder pattern. This is a lot better than having super long constructors with parameters you may never even use. It's important to provide the required parameters though. These are denoted in the Java docs as well as the official documentation. For example, submitting a high score consists of the following. Each request requires a game ID. This is a unique identifier for your specific game. Guess this is a player's username or whatever they want to associate with their score. Score and sort can be a little confusing. Score is a string that represents the public facing score that other players will see. So feel free to jazz it up with commas, dollar signs, phrases, or whatever is relevant to your game. Sort is a number that represents your score numerically and will be used for sorting. This is provided as a long even though the spec calls for integer because int has a very limited range. If your game uses money as a type of score, for example, Jeff Bezos would not be able to enjoy your game otherwise at a net worth of 178.2 billion. Keep in mind that primitive values and requests are often substituted for their object wrapper counterparts, like capital L long instead of lowercase long. This is necessary in the lib for null checking optional parameters. When you add a score, you should not expect any meaningful data to be returned from the server. You are just submitting a score. Nevertheless, you should still check for failures and ensure that the submission was successful. You can do this by creating a listener. Notice that the listener matches the request. Scores add listener for scores add request. The data value returned by the listener is important for requests that you expect to get data for. For example, a user's fetch value will contain all the info about a provided user. The request and listener won't do anything on its own, however. You need to send the request. 
This will send an HTTP GET request asynchronously so your game will still be running while you wait for a response. It's a good practice to show a loading graphic while this occurs so the user won't prematurely exit the game before it's finished. When it's complete, the listener methods will be called. Sending a single request is perfectly fine for most use of the API. If you get into more advanced use, such as creating an asynchronous multiplayer game, you'll need to send your request in batch for maximum efficiency. This allows you to send multiple requests, up to 50 at a time, which eliminates the overhead of waiting for a response between each call. Requests is an array of separate requests. You can add multiple listeners, but you should really only have one listener for each type of request that you have added. There are parameters for parallel and break on error. Parallel instructs the server to process your request simultaneously. This is great if you want a fast response, but it doesn't work well if each request you're making is expecting the last one to have been completed. Break on error stops all subsequent requests if any single one fails. These two options cannot be used in tandem. Read the official docs if you want to learn more about how batch requests work. To take advantage of user-specific data stores, sessions, trophies, and friends, you need to have the user's username and token. The user's token is not their password. Never ask your players to provide their password. The token is a special phrase used solely for the GameJolt API. A token is preferred because the player can easily change it if it gets leaked. It also won't allow a hacker to access their account or do anything nefarious. Prompting the user to log in is rather clumsy though. You can provide it as an option, but don't expect anyone to know where to find their token or what it even means. Instead, you should take advantage of automatic login. If the user is accessing your game through the official GameJolt desktop app, a text file called .jg-credentials is added to the root of your executable or jar file. You can access the user values through the provided utility method and then submit those through a request. This example will award an achievement to the user without any prompts. Similarly, HTML5 games are passed the user info through the URL parameters. The easiest way to get these is through the window class. You may only access window through the HTML5 backend, so make sure to read the article on interfacing with platform-specific code. You can also just pass these values through your constructor of your application listener class. Using this method will work for the GameJolt app as well as the website. Now that you can log in the user, you can get some data about them. Each logged in user in GameJolt can upload an avatar image. You can actually use this image in your game. This is great for showing who your top scorers are. Users Fetch always returns a list of users, even if you expect there to only be one result, so we're just getting the first value here. Avatar URL is just a string that points to the image. You can use the utility method download image URL as texture to get a texture region you can use in your game. Make sure to check out the full working example that I made with sources down in the description. This demonstrates pretty much every aspect of the API. The code is kind of all over the place, but it's broken down into several methods which describe the intent of each block. Now you are a master of the API. All you have to do is create an awesome game with it, then upload it to GameJolt. That is, create a package, then a release, which is more like a version. Upload an executable or HTML5 zip. Don't forget to change the stage of development, then publish it. That's it. Your game is playable and now connected to one of the best free game data servers you can find. Good luck and happy hunting, GDXers! Now the Red GDX community is gonna be alright, Braelius. Lie! The GDX is still popular. Yeah. <laughs>